All right. Last time. Hey, Kyle Toomey, you just missed a prayer. You have to go back out now. <laughs> it's over, man. It's a closed session now. Uh, so last time we covered these books, and <clears throat> obviously you can see that if you, know, if you know the order of your Bible, the way it sits, Proverbs and Psalm, we, we skipped some things after 1 Samuel. We skipped Kings, we skipped Chronicles. We're doing that on purpose because we're going to thread those through with the prophets that go with them. So like Isaiah being who with, uh, there with, Malachi being with who, those guys. And then Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther come before Job, but they're really far at the end of the, the historical line on the canon because that's when everybody comes back to Israel, back to Jerusalem and sets up the temple and then sets up the wall. So we're going to kind of more in the actual historical lineage than we are going through as it is canonically. That just means like in the canon of the Bible, the order the books are in. So we're, this is the way that we've been going. So for review, these first five books, what are they called? Anybody? Pentateuch, Pentateuch right? And, and then what would Jesus have called it when he's referring to them when he's on earth in the four gospels? The law, right, right. So you can say the Pentateuch, Pentateuch just means five books, uh, but also the law, that that's the Old Testament law that we saw in there. Um, and we'll go back over this. And then Joshua and Judges, what's happening in, in these two books right here, as far as history goes? Conquest of the promised land, and then what? What's Judges? Failure in the promised land. Yeah, you can, that's a good way to describe it. Conquest and then failure. Everything's good with Joshua. Joshua dies and everything goes into the pits. And then they're, but they're still in the land. Then the book of Ruth and Samuel, before we describe them, why do they connect? Do you remember that? What's their big connecting point between Ruth and Samuel? David. Why is David the connecting point? Ruth's lineage, right? Because Ruth is David's great-grandmother, right? So David's the connecting point in both of these. But Ruth is set in what time period? Judges, judges right. So she lives in the time when the judges ruled the earth. And then David's not the first guy we see in the book of Samuel. Obviously, we see Samuel first. But David becomes the chief focus, right? And then... We do a weird jump, and we go to Job and Psalms. Why are we, why did we go from Samuel to Job? That was kind of, that felt like a hard shift when we did that last semester. Why did we do that? It's kind of an obscure reason now when I think about it, but we did have a reason. <laughs> There you go. It's wisdom literature. Wisdom of kings. <laughs> Evan does office next door to me. Uh, that's not a K. That looks like a big N, but Susan, that's going to be a K. We have a spy in the back, but she teaches for the women's class, so it's okay. Um, wisdom of the kings. So David starts this. He's the first good, real king, right? Because Saul, it goes Samuel, then Saul, then David. And David's like the premier prototype king that the people they were they wanted just to be famous they wanted to be like the nations they wanted to be strong and God rejects them for that but then still gives them a king like they wanted and see that's how see how what you really wanted was that and then David comes along and he is the king that's supposed to be and the wisdom of kings Job is a wisdom book not written by a king but still wisdom literature Psalms is poetry, full of wisdom, but full of Godward thinking, and Godward feeling, rather. Proverbs is also wisdom literature, and so is Ecclesiastes. We're going to get to those. But that's why we jump from Samuel, King David, to the wisdom literature, because those are the, the kings are supposed to be wise. The kings were supposed to do what, according to Deuteronomy 17? What were they supposed to do? One, one special thing. This is a bonus. Right. They're supposed to write the law. They write a copy of the law by their own hand in the presence of a priest. 
So you don't change anything and make it easier. You write, write a copy of the law. They were supposed to do that according to Deuteronomy. So God did have a plan for kings. So we can't look at that scene, the scene in Samuel when Saul comes up and go, well, that was never part of the deal. They were never supposed to have a king. Well, no, they were supposed to have one. They just weren't supposed to want one like the nations. They weren't supposed to, we, we want to be like them. We want to look like our neighbors. And God's like, I have a timeline and plan for this. And Samuel knew it. And he was like, I'm done with these people. Forget them. And God says, it's not your problem. They, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. But I'll give them a king. I'll give them what they want. And they'll see what it's really like. Then I'll go ahead and bring about my guy. So they were supposed to write a copy of the law. Now, um, the thread that we've been following to connect all these things, because what we don't want to do is just go fill you up with like, yeah, okay, this is what happens here, what happens here, what happens here, and now you just know what happens in books, because that's, that's not really how it's going. I mean, you could do the same thing with Harry Potter. Like, well, that's what happens in book five, that's what happens in book six, and now you just know what is where. That's, that, that has to be the foundation point. We wanna, we wanna, that's part of the reason why we're doing this, is so that when you are reading through your Bible and you plop down in the middle of Judges, you know what's going on, where I am in the story, but what is that story? What, what have we been calling the, the history that goes through here? What trail are we following? A thread that runs through it. These are all beads. What's the thread? God's plan for redemption. Redemptive history. That's what we're, that's what we're after. Redemptive history. And you can look at it like the redemptive historical perspective. But redemptive history is what all of this should be pointing to. Because we've we, we got to get to Jesus. And why do we have to get to Jesus according to Genesis? What are we waiting for? Right. This, God promises out of pure grace, when, that, when humanity falls from him and sins from him in Genesis, he gives them, in the cursing, he gives them a promise of grace. And the promise is, I will send a seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent. This, this thing that you opened up, this problem of sin, this presence of the devil, him being the God of this world, I'm going to fix all of that with the seed of a woman. And so we continually are looking for that as redemptive history unfolds. So we see it in lots of different places. We see Moses picking up here in Exodus through the end of Deuteronomy, he looks like he could be the guy. He's not the guy. Why is he not the guy? Why is Moses not the one that's going to be able to crush the head of the serpent? <laughs> he did kill people. He kills people in Exodus, right? And then he goes out to Midian and then he comes back in, right? He doesn't get to go to the promised land, does he? No. So how could God's guy be somebody who's excluded from the promised land? So he can't be that. Joshua, he looks like he could really be the guy. He's maybe one of the better candidates in the entire part of the Old Testament we've gone through now. But even he's still not the guy. Because Hebrews, the book of Hebrews says, remember if we looked at that when we read Joshua, that the rest that Joshua gave people when they came into the land was, was not full rest. It was not the, the, the eternal rest. There was still evil all around them. And really, they didn't kill everybody in the land like they should have because that's what happens here. You left some of those Canaanites in there and then you're like, yeah, their gods seem like they could be okay. We'll just kind of blend a little bit. We'll just let you be. And then you just get co totally co-opted by them. Then Ruth is this kind of interlude to get us to David but she's obviously not the seed of the woman because she is a woman. David, he's, gosh, it looks like it really could be him. And then you have two, maybe three colossal sin moments in David's life. So he can't be the one to crush the seed, uh, to crush the head of the serpent. And then we interlude with, with further with wisdom of kings. That this is the kind of way that the, that the, the, the God, God's intended coming one to crush the head of the serpent. The Messiah is what we're going to see him be called in the prophets this semester. That, that guy is going to think like Job in perfection. He's going to completely understand the presence of evil and the goodness of God and the sovereignty of God, even though you haven't sinned. That somebody can really suffer 
and God still be good and sovereign. Isn't that what Jesus is going to do perfectly? He's going to suffer for us, even though God is good and the suffering is unjust. And the, and the Psalms, they all, when we talk about Messianic Psalms, they point to Jesus. They reference Jesus. Jesus quotes them on the cross. Jesus quotes them on the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain. He's constantly quoting from the Psalms. And we're going to see Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, the big major themes of those two books of wisdom. The coming king that David was a prototype of and Joshua kind of looked like, he has all that wisdom, that, all that understanding of God already. So that's the, the redemptive history part of this because we want to be thinking through our Bibles as one connected story. It's all it's not, an, it's not just a collection of writings that happened around the same time around similar topics. They're not disjointed, even though the genres are different. Because we have law here, we have history here, and then we have wisdom here, and then we're going to get to prophecy later on this year. So they're not all disjointed. They're all different genres talking about the same redemptive historical idea of how are we going to be redeemed how is what was undone here in genesis going to be all put back together and then made completely new eternally so that's what we're all headed towards that's what the old testament is heading towards so jesus is in the old testament all over it and we and if we don't know it then then when we see jesus come in matthew 3 for the first time it's just not as impactful we're not looking for a, a, a king that's better than David or a leader that's better than Joshua or a mediator that's better than Moses. We don't know who to look for. And then the book of Leviticus, what was the big thing in the Leviticus that we saw that, that Jesus is the, full, is the fullness of, that it was just the, the type of? What was the thing in Leviticus? Scapegoat, Scapegoat right? Leviticus 16, remember this the day of atonement. There's a scapegoat that goes out with the sins. Can, the priest puts his hands on the head of the goat, confesses the sins of the people. The goat goes out, and then the other one gets slaughtered and blood spread all over the mercy seat. And then what does John say the first time he sees Jesus in John 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that everybody who has been living in Leviticus law goes, there he is. That's the lamb that was supposed to, it connected everything for them in their minds when John said that in their presence. Which is why it immediately made him be hated by the, the leaders of the time. The leaders of the, the, the temple keepers of the time. So, covered a whole lot of things. Then we have this thing running throughout our... Uh, our uh, study, we, we've been calling them tent poles. The four big, what's the first big one? Anybody remember it? Genesis 3. You get Genesis 3.15, which goes to what? What's the next one? Same book. Abraham, Genesis 12. <laughs> right. Genesis 12. You really can do one through three, but then you could really lump in with Genesis 12. You can lump in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 because that's the same promise to Abraham that just kind of gets progressively expanded in Abraham's own lifetime. So that's, that's that one. Then what's the next one we saw? Davidic covenant. Second Sam 7. I forgot how to spell Samuel. It's my own middle name. Good night. Second Samuel 7. And that's the last one we saw. The next one we're going to see in Jeremiah, but that's going to take us a couple of weeks to get there. But these are tent poles. Why? Yes. Because God promised in Genesis 3.15, I will eliminate this evil with, through an individual who is not born from the seed of man. And then you're like, okay, well, what's going on? How are you going to do that? He goes to Abraham. You is who it's going to come from. Through you and the one I'm going to, I'm going to bless this people, make you into a many nations. That's, it's going to come through Abraham. And you're like, okay, well, Abraham, you said that he's going to have kids as many as the sand on the seashore and then the stars in the sky. So how, where is it going to come from in and amongst his own kids? David. Now we've limited it down to one tribe, tribe of Judah, to one guy in that tribe, 
David, your family specifically. So now we've narrowed it down even further. And then we're going to see it just get com- expanded in the beautifully with the, wor- with the words, the new covenant. Not given to one individual. Like this is given to Eve, Adam, or uh, Abraham, David. The new covenant is a prophecy for all the people of God given by Jeremiah. So we're going to see that as our last tentpole before you make the big leap into the New Testament. Because then Jesus says in Luke 22, this is my blood of the new covenant. And you're like, Whoa. Then he just run back. He just run back and strung all of this together by saying that in the upper room the night before he died. So that's a little preview. I wasn't marketing on that, but you showed up on the first week. You got it. You got the early stuff. So that's kind of run down. We caught up to where we are now, just kind of has, as we've been going through things. So get your mind in the set thinking, like, we had kings come in, saw the life of David. He's as good as it's going to get as far as kings go. We're going to see that when we get to the book of First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles, which in the Jewish Bible is just one humongous book. Uh, but when we get to Kings and Chronicles, we'll see, yep, David was as good as it gets, and David is the measuring stick. Because each, each successive king, they're going to say about, like, well, he did not follow in the footsteps of his father David. Or he did follow in the footsteps of his father David. Like, he's just going to be the one that they can keep going back to. Saul never gets mentioned again. So the wisdom of kings is where we are now. We're in the middle of that wisdom literature. So we saw Job and with dealing with the problem of evil and the, God's goodness and sovereignty. And my sin doesn't bring about my pain. Always, necessarily, because Job doesn't sin. We saw Psalms, and we saw them this summer, just in Sunday morning sermons. But now we're going to go to Proverbs. Proverbs, we're going to spend our time this morning. When, just based on what you know of Proverbs, without looking at the stuff I pre-wrote up there, what, is, what has Proverbs been to you? If you were going to describe Proverbs to a new believer or to a non-Christian who is like, man, I read the Bible and I opened up to the middle, and I read these things, what are they? How would you describe Proverbs to uh, that kind of person? Prayers Prayers or praise? Yeah. What else? How would you describe them? Wisdom on how to live? Good daily devotional? What makes them, that's a good point, what makes Proverbs a good daily devotional? There you go. That was what I was going to say at the end. Turner, that was my big crescendo. <laughs> no, it's, you're dead on, though. 31 days in a month, 31 chapters. That's great. And, and it, you can do that, and you can read them real quick. And then you do it again the next month, and it'll be like, I, I've never read any of this stuff. This all sounds so new. Because each, each verse is just a couplet of wisdom that, that you could mull on all day long. So, yeah, Proverbs is, is maybe one of the most... Uh, culturally acceptable books. No, nobody in the secular world is mad at some of the Proverbs that just talk about, hey, be nice, don't be a hothead, uh, don't, you know, don't align yourself with evil people, kings should be fair, uh, righteous people are good, like those kinds of things. We're like, ah, oh, yeah, that's great. Well, that sounds like, what, what other religious ideas does that sound like outside of Christianity? Sounds like Buddhism, Confucianism. Like a lot of Eastern wisdom is very proverbial in the sense that it just is a smart saying that sounds kind of true. So we're going to have to figure out now what makes Proverbs God-breathed and what makes Confucius nothing. Because Proverbs can't just be our version of witty, pithy sayings on how to have your best life now. It's got to be something more than that. It can't be limited to just this. And we're going to have to answer the biggest question is, where is Jesus in the Proverbs? Because if you teach Romans or you teach any of the four Gospels in the New Testament, then somebody comes back and reads Proverbs and says, I need to be righteous in order to be saved, it looks like, in Proverbs. That sounds like it's completely contradictory to Jesus. Because Proverbs just sounds like a good kick in the pants. Hey, quit being a lazy bum. Hey, quit being wicked and evil. You're like, yeah, okay, you're right, okay, this is my football coach for the week, is Proverbs. But it's, it's got to be more than just that, because Egypt has that. China has that. 
What does Israel have? What is the wisdom that Israel has been given? And how does it differ from the rest of the world? So that's what we're going to look at this morning. So turn your Bibles, Proverbs 1. (laughs) That's no good. Let's read verses 1 through 7. So just, somebody can read the whole chunk if you want, or you can read and just stop if you start feeling self-conscious. Go for it. Sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. All right. So that's kind of just the intro. The preamble to what Solomon says, we saw there it's Solomon, right? The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. We're going to see later on that he's not the author of the whole book, but most of it. All but two chapters at the end. And he gives the intro right there as to why he's writing. So that you can know wisdom and have instruction, understand wisdom. And it, we get it, Solomon. You're, you're about wisdom. Proverbs is a book of wisdom and what is wise and how to live life on the earth. And where does it all begin? What does verse 7 say? Fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? That sounds good. It sounds really Bible-y. But how would I describe that to somebody like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to fear the Lord today because I want to have wisdom, and that's where wisdom begins. What is, what is fear of the Lord? Right, right, and there's a <laughs> there is an element of the proverbs of that 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 there's a contrast of the righteous and the wicked, the one who obeys, the one who disobeys. Right, right, right. That there are consequences. So the the fear of the Lord, though, Stephen, you said really well. Y'all partnered together really well in the definition that I, understanding God's holiness and who I am in light of that. It, so fear, you can think of awe. It's not like trembling terror like a, uh, like a slave feels to an overbearing and evil master. But it is an, an awe and a sense of like, you are completely other than me. You are holy and I am the opposite of all of that. So if you don't get that right, then you're not going to understand any of this. You're not going to get anything. The, the greatest virtue in the book of Proverbs, you could just say, is the fear of Yahweh. As that's the Hebrew word that, for God that no Israelite would ever say. But the fear of Yahweh, that's the overarching virtue of the whole thing. The, the book of Proverbs is bookended by that. The fear of the Lord we see in 1.7 and then again in 31.30. The, so Solomon is a man saying the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 3130 describes the ideal, the ideal biblical godly woman, which is why the, uh, the Hebrew Bible puts Ruth after Proverbs, because you're supposed to read that chapter 31 of Proverbs and go, who is that woman? And then you see Ruth, and you're like, oh, she's that woman. But that, that still says that that kind of woman fears the Lord. Men and women, all who God has created, that's where wisdom lies fear of the Lord. Well, then we have to ask the question then is what is wisdom? Because why do we care if we have it or not? What is wisdom? If we're supposed to fear the Lord and that's where it starts, it sounds like we're supposed to want wisdom. What is it? How'd you define it? The ability to make good choices. The ability to make good choices. Awesome. What else? Get some more brains thinking on this. Understanding what God's will is in that particular decision or choice that we have to make. Right. So, yeah, so then, yeah, choices, which is 
kind of what our lives consist of, right? We're, we're, we're making choice after choice after choice after choice constantly to wake up or not or hit snooze. I mean, that's how our day starts. I'm making a choice, right? So wisdom in making choices, really, you can think about it too, is how to successfully navigate life, which is a series of choices. And th that's what wisdom you could just summarize as, is that if I want to do this, it needs to start with the fear of the Lord, because the fear of the Lord is what is true. That's understanding what is true about God. And whatever's true about God, if, if God is true, if what we've read up to this point in the Old Testament is true about God, Evan, the, the video, it fell down, so I had to put it back up. I know, it just it got possessed and fell over. A mighty wind blew through. Um, and so Proverbs is helpful along those lines for us how to live wisely. So these are the four themes. We're going to get to those here in a second. Uh, but there's, a, there's many themes in the book of Proverbs that you can go down through. Uh, and some of the Proverbs stand on their own. This is one of the one book that you can maybe take out of context the most, and it's almost never out of context because they're, they're little couplets of wise sayings. So you can just lift it up and put it on your coffee mug without it being something that you've totally taken out of context and it means something different now. These are wise, short sayings for us uh, as Christians, mostly written by King Solomon. And we read in... Um, we read 1 through 7, but then verse 8 says this. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. So Solomon is starting this book out, coming at it from a, a parental perspective. I want you, child, son, to, ta to have the wisdom uh, of God. And it starts with the fear of the Lord. Solomon starts there from a really familial perspective. It's not, he's not starting out like an Eastern religion guy, a guru on top of a hill. You come up to me and I'll give you the, the light of life. It's not, it's not outside. It, what you know, more in-depth scholarly works describe where, where's the nucleus of, of Israelite wisdom. It's not in the marketplace. It's not in even in the, the center for religious worship, it's in the home. The, the fam, like the family, the nucleus of the family, we're going to see tons of relationships like that when we get down to context for wives living. But that's where it starts. Solomon giving wisdom to his son. And in the book of Proverbs, there isn't a ton of redemptive historical progression in the sense that something more has been added to the story that we're following through here, but there's not nothing that's added to it. Because we do still have to answer the question, why is this different than Confucius? Why is this different than Buddha? We're going to have to answer that question, and Proverbs will get to that for us. But the outline of the book is kind of just limited to authorship. So you can think of it, 1 through 9 is Solomon talking mainly to his son, and then 10 through 29. Let's write these down. Uh, Fell again, Evan. <laughs> uh, chapter 10 through 29 is Solomon, just kind of generally speaking. And then 30 through 31 is two different kings. Uh... Lemuel and Agur, which are non-Israelite kings, but nevertheless their wisdom was, was, a, uh, was compiled with the wisdom of Solomon and by the compiler of this uh, book of the Bible. So the theme statement that somebody came up with was, <coughs> wisdom is fearing the Lord being teachable, and having skill in godly living. The source, the means, and the goal of the wisdom is the Lord. Can y'all think of a New Testament parallel to the book of Proverbs? A book that sounds like Proverbs, but it's James. 
James is a New Testament parallel, very similar. Because James, it, it's the big criticism against James, uh, at least by people who are bold enough to criticize the Bible, is that uh, there's not enough gospel in it. Because Jesus' name only appears two times, I think, in the book of James. And, re- and one of them is when he's describing, James is describing his own relationship to Jesus, that he's his brother. But there's not no gospel in it, and there's not no gospel in Proverbs, which is what we'll see. That the fearing the Lord, being teachable, and having skill in godly living, that that's, that's what the book of Proverbs is about. And Proverbs is different than Job and Ecclesiastes. I keep pointing to the other side. Ecclesiastes is somewhere over here. We're not there yet. Uh, it, because Proverbs is God's wisdom as it is revealed and is in, as it's harmonized in life. Because Proverbs is, that's why it's so approachable for all of us, because it's like, do this, don't do that. Do this and don't do that. This is what fools do. This is what wise people do. This is what wicked people do. This is what righteous people do. It's simple. There's not a lot of interpretation that goes in here, except for when it gets into stuff like having oxen in your barns and it's going to make it dirty, but it'll get more produce. We've got to figure that one out. But most of it is pretty straightforward. Job and Ecclesiastes is the wisdom of God in his hiddenness. Right? Because Job never hears God speak until the end when he's about to make the wrong decision. And Ecclesiastes is the vanity of vanities. None of this matters. None of this is, this is all worthless until it's finally not. So those are God and his hiddenness and wisdom. But Proverbs is God's wisdom and its revelation and its obviousness. That's the significant difference between that book and the other books of, the, um, of wisdom. So the point of Proverbs is not how to have a better life. It's to know God, to know the mind of God, because the fear of the Lord. I can't fear something that I don't know. I can't be in awe of something that I don't know. I mean, what makes us more in awe of the vastness of the skies? Me sitting around on my phone or going out to way west Texas and getting on that telescope and looking up at the stars and realizing how small you are. The more you know, the more in awe you are, and then the more you rightly order your own life. So that's what Proverbs is instructing us to. Like this is going to, this is going to, you're going to have to know God in order to be able to do this. So the Proverbs in general are principles for godly living that lead to a blessed life. In general. Now we have to leave that caveat there because what's happened in Proverbs, we all have our favorite one in here, right? That you, you look to and you go, oh, like, here you go, Proverbs 3 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding and all your ways and all to Him and He will make your paths straight. Like, oh, my straight paths, that means easy living. And, I'm, and I know that because straight paths are easier to walk than crooked paths. So if I acknowledge the Lord in all my ways, then I will have straight paths. My life will be easy. Well, what about Job? What about Joseph? So we read those and we can say, in general, these things are true because most people are not Job. Most people, God's not saying, have you considered my servant, Tommy, Satan? I want you to particularly go after him. That's not happening to most people. What happens to some people? So Proverbs are not promises from God. They're general truths that are generally true, because it just, it, it's generally true that if I live according to God's word and I'm striving for righteousness, I'm striving to, for holiness, to be like him as much as I can, then things will tend to be better than me, right? Better for me. My marriage tends to be better off. My kids tend to be better off. But there's promises in here that we can look at, like Proverbs 22, verse 6. Let me read that to you. Um, that we, if we take this verse, we, we, this is, this is uh, sold in every Christian bookstore from 1985 to 1999. And then it went away. A little, little sign you could put in your baby room. Verse, tw- verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Does anybody know kids with godly parents who went off the rails? Well, what about this verse? This is a, pr- it's a promise right here. I mean, that's why we can't. Take that because even the Bible has examples of that. Manoah is a godly father to Samson, and Samson is a putz. Manoah does everything right. His wife is so godly as well, and Samson ends up being a complete idiot. 
So this, this verse is not always true, but it is generally true. Because what does God say in his promise to Abraham? This promise is to you and your children. Yeah. It's generally true in that even if they go off and be stupid, they, they may come back. Right, because they at least have something to come back to. It, it is generally true in a lot of ways. But even I, I mean, my first example of this was one of the godliest guys I knew. He was my friend of my dad and had kids that were like 10 years older than me. Maybe, maybe 12 years older than me. And two of them were just awesome, all-stars. They were in the court a and They achieved so much in life. They were very godly. They have very godly families and kids right now. And one son just went, like, how do you get two, two out of three? When you, like, what home existed for these two sons to be awesome? But then this son goes up. I mean, it's because God is sovereign over all those things. But this is generally true, but it's not a guaranteed promise from the Lord. And that's why we have to understand genre, right? These are wise sayings. These are not God speaking promises to us. When, we, when God says a promise, then that should get our attention. That is relatively few highlights in our Bible, but we should know them. But these are generally true statements. We need to know that right off the bat. But some Proverbs, though, this is just to be more confusing, are always true. So look at chapter 16. We can rattle off a few real quick in chapter 16, that are always true, and they are always true because they describe God. Not circumstances in life, but they describe who God is and how he functions. So let's look at 16.1. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Always true. You can plan and do whatever you want, but God is in control. And then go to verse 2. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Always true. You may think that your ways are pure, but God really is looking at your heart and understanding it clearly. Verse 4. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Always true. God is the one sovereign over all things, even the wicked. Verse 5. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Always true. That's always true of God. And then verse 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Again, that's always true. But it's because it's describing God, not describing what can happen in your life or what leads to pleasant living in life, because that can change. Uh, When you think of the book of Proverbs as a manual for fulfilling God's creation mandate, dominion over the earth. How do we exercise dominion over the earth? We... We do what God says to do, and that's what Proverbs is all about, doing what God says to do. So we're fulfilling the creation mandate comes in Genesis, remember? Fill the earth, multiply, have dominion over it, take care of my things, work all these things. Uh, But we still read these as generally true, because we need to understand genre. Now what you can do is you can go, well, it says that, and we are literalists. The Bible is literal, and we take it literally. And that is true, but do we take it literally in John when Jesus says that he is the door of the sheepfold? Is he literally a wooden rectangle? No, right, he doesn't swing on hinges. Is he, when he says, I'm the bread of life, is Jesus a loaf of bread in the shape of a wooden rectangular door? So obviously we understand that there are literary devices that happen. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says, never let the sun go down on your anger. What does that mean that if you ever go to sleep without perfectly being resolved with resolutions with your wife, that you're just condemned by all, beyond all get out? What if you live in Nome, Alaska, where it never comes, becomes nighttime? Like, so, or it's always nighttime when it's winter. Like when, then you, if it's wintertime, then you never have to resolve anything because the sun never goes down. So we understand that that means don't let conflict fester, right? You can't let that sit and be there. So we, this is how we have to understand Proverbs. We have to understand it according to its genre. So Proverbs has a bunch of parallelisms in them. It's like, uh, that's what Hebrew poetry device, we talked about that when we talked about the Psalms. It's like, da, 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 da. And then a new topic, da, 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 da. Two lines, either comparing or, con- or uh, contrasting. That the, the righteous person is like this, and he will be like this. Or the righteous person is like this, and the fool is like this. Or the wise person gets this, and the sluggard gets this. That it's either comparing or it's contrasting, but it's parallelism. That's a Hebrew poetry structure. Remember we talked about with Psalms, it's not based on rhyme. It's based on more paralleling, back and forthing. 
where there's lots of figures of speech in, in the, the book of Proverbs about like cheating your neighbor, but talking about moving a landmark. There's a rock in the corner of your field, and if you scoot it out further, that means you had more land. So we're not necessarily saying that the book of Proverbs is only talking about making sure your property boundaries are correct, so make sure you get your laser level out there and don't you ever do anything more. No, it's saying don't cheat your neighbor. So figures of speech is what it uses a lot as well. The four themes. That's what we're going to get to in our last 15 minutes, though. Four themes. Now, you can read... This is just one way to cut up the book of Proverbs. I think it's helpful, but you can read a hundred different commentaries and get a hundred different ways to decide the Proverbs. Nobody is confused on the outline of the book of John. Nobody's confused on the outline of the book of Joshua or Genesis. Everybody's got a different slice on Proverbs, that this is how you break it up. And they're nuancing it in some way, like, well, chapter 25 kind of stands alone because it's on its own thing before you get to chapter 29. We're just going to use big major themes that go throughout because we just need a grid to understand this book. The first one, there is a major theme of contrasting wise living. So in order, a lot of times to understand what's wise, you have to look at what's foolish. And that's a lot of times when we're explaining things to our kids. They can't get the concept, so, but that they can understand the opposite of the concept. So the book of Proverbs uses that a lot. 17.24 is a good example of that. It says, The discerning sets his faith, face towards wisdom, but the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. Contrasting. The eyes of the fool is looking out to everything else, like, oh, I'm going to go after that, I'm going to go after that, I'm going to go get that, and everything, the world's my oyster. But the, but the wise person, the discerning, sets his face towards wisdom. I'm going to go after God's wisdom. So there's a contrast there between wisdom and folly. Uh, but there's also the sluggard that appears in the book of Proverbs. Fool is by far the majority, the, the majority shareholder of the contrast to wisdom. But the sluggard appears often in the book of Proverbs. And uh, that's where we get to the chapter 6, verse 6. Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. So he's saying, sluggard, you're the opposite of wisdom, and you can learn something from an ant. Because what does she do? Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When, you arri- will you, when will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a robber and want like an armed man. So that's the opposite of wisdom. The sluggard is the person who's not wise because they're not taking advantage of what's available to them now. They're not, t- not that we're opportunistic, but there is a time for harvest and there is a time for planting that we need to do things in those times. And so that's the contrast to wise living. And the sluggard is not the person who's just an outright refusal. We see in the book of Proverbs that it's just the person who's kind of making lots of little micro decisions to go, well, you know, I, the, the sluggard is the one who puts his hand in the dish but won't even bring it up to his mouth. I wanted to eat this whole thing, but I, I just can't. So, I, you know, the, the person who just makes tiny decisions and ends up doing nothing. The contrast to wise living. Or, yeah, contrast to wise living. But there's a context for wise living. This what describes we have the family, but then we have two dynamics in the family in the book of Proverbs. The husband and wife relationship and the parent and child relationship all over the book of Proverbs. We already saw the, the uh, train of the child and the way he should go verse. That's parenting. Uh, but also, if you spare the rod, you hate your son. That's in the book of Proverbs. But then there's tons of context about husbands and wives, and particularly wives. Because Solomon's writing from the husband's perspective, right? And then you get m- wisdom to all men in chapters 1 through seven, just dealing with the adulterous woman, the call of lust. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, negative things written about, uh, like it's better to live in the corner of a house than with a contentious woman. It's better, to, it's better to have water dripping on your face continually than have a nagging wife. I mean, there's lots of Proverbs along those lines, but also Proverbs about enjoying your wife. Chapter five 
chapter 5, the, the, the wisdom is, why are you letting your water spill out in the street? Meaning, why are you taking what's most precious and putting it anywhere? It should go directly to your wife. It should stay in that well. So there's that context for wise living with marriage, family, kids, how we relate to each other is the context for it. But the last one I forgot to put on here is friendships. The friend sticks closer to a brother. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, rather, is a proverb. As iron sharpens iron, show one man sharpens another, Proverbs 27. So we have these friendship contexts, that, that we have a biblical framework for that. And Solomon would have even understood that on a very personal level, hearing his dad tell stories about his relationship to Jonathan. That there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. All of David's brothers were losers. And he had a friend named Jonathan who stuck closer than a brother. So there's context for wise living and amongst our friends. Describes real friends as being sensible, selfless, forgiving each other, sharpening each other. Then you have the third theme. Communication in wise living. Speaking and listening are the two big ideas there. There's wise things to say using your words carefully. For instance, Proverbs 13. Let me turn there. 13.3. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. You ever been in that situation? With your boss, with your spouse, with your anybody? If I had just not said anything, I would have guarded my life. Uh, This this is all over the Proverbs. Uh, 17.27, whoever restrains his words has knowledge. He who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Uh... There's, uh, I'm trying to find my, one of my favorite ones, where it's even a fool who doesn't say anything is wise. I can't remember. I can't find that one. I'll, have to send it, I'll get to you next time. But he, like even even the, the the stupidest person alive, if he's quiet, there's at least wisdom in that, because now nobody knows that he's stupid. Like that's Solomon's dead on the nose on that one. So we have these wise living, but then even more so. There's wisdom in not saying anything but listening. That a wise person is not always talking and speaking wisely, but is listening. Seeking All throughout the book of Proverbs, there's a call to come and seek wisdom. Come and get wisdom. If you get anything, get wisdom. If you get anything, get understanding, get knowledge, get instruction. And what are you doing if you're getting wisdom, knowledge, and instruction? You're not talking. You're listening. So the wisdom of that is how we communicate in wise living, there's a, that there's a context for that. Lastly, the outcome of wisdom that we see. We're going to, Proverbs 19, 16, we'll read that for us. It says, whoever keeps the commandment keeps his life. He who despises his ways will die. We're not a static people. We are in motion. We are going to answer for what we have said and what we have done. So there is a, there's a coming, an outcome of wisdom that it can either, if I pursue it or reject it, there will be an outcome from that. I will have a result that, that comes from that. But then we come to the end of that and then we have to ask this major question, where is Jesus in Proverbs? I had a guy come up to me after we were going through Romans, preaching through Romans, and he was like, I hear you saying all of this stuff about righteousness, that we don't have any righteousness within us and that we need righteousness that comes from outside of us and that has to come from Jesus, that what he achieved in perfect living and then on the cross is put on us. Isaiah has the imagery of it robing us. We're robed in that righteousness. But in the Proverbs, I see righteousness being very attainable because it tells us pursue righteousness, get righteousness, be righteous, behave righteously. So then how does Proverbs not a direct contradiction to the gospel? We have to find Jesus in here. One of the most plain places, I think, in the book of Proverbs is chapter 16, verse 6. Somebody read that when you get there. So we have iniquity, and it needs to be atoned for. And how is it atoned for? Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. 
Now, we can read Proverbs 1-7, and then here again, 16-6, and then all else throughout the book of Proverbs is the fear of the Lord. But if you're honest with yourself, what are you going to say? I don't fear the Lord. (laughs) I do things all the time in defiance of God. I, I can't even get out of my house before work without doing something like that. So therefore, how are my sins going to be atoned for? Because Proverbs 16, 6 says that by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. I don't steadfastly love God and I have no faithfulness towards him in and of myself. There must be someone coming in the progress, remember, redemptive history, who can do that. And it's got to be the one that God said will crush the head of the serpent. It's got to be one who's similar to David but better because David's a man after God's own heart and he has colossal failures in his life. So Proverbs 16, 6 says, you have sin that needs to be atoned for. That's where Jesus is, is how am I going to do this? Because you could read all of Proverbs and you should read all of Proverbs regularly and go, I can't do any of this stuff. I, I can't even remember all of this stuff. You could think, you know what? The Ten Commandments are pretty easy. When I see them here in Exodus 20 and then here in Deuteronomy 5, I can do those things. I can keep from murdering people. I can keep from making idols. You could trick yourself into thinking, I can do these commandments. Jesus disproves that later on in Matthew 5 and 6. But then when you read the book of Proverbs, you go, yep, got that. I mean, you can't even make it out of chapter 1 without going, I've, I've missed all of these. Every single verse of these, I can't do any of this stuff. I don't fear the Lord in these ways. So then, therefore, I need a Redeemer. I need someone to come and pay for this sin that I'm piling up on myself. So Proverbs then also shows us Jesus because it shows our need for Jesus. And in Matthew 12, this is also where Jesus is. Matthew 12, 42. You want to write that down? You can. But all of the wisdom of Solomon, all of the wisdom of God is said to be in Jesus. He can do all of this perfectly. All of this he does perfectly. He contradicts the fool. He yells at the sluggard he, and corrects the sluggard. The family, he's the perfect son, the perfect brother. And he does have a wife, us, the church. So he perfectly interacts with his wife. He does have children as God our father. He's the perfect friend. You have a friend in Jesus. We see all these things that he speaks wisely. He listens to people when they talk. I mean, all on and on, Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of the book of Proverbs. So we should see him there as well. Lastly, I don't have necessarily a, an uncommon thing about the book of Proverbs, except for the, the word stupid appears in the ESV translation a whole bunch. And I think that's important. <laughs> we need to know that. Like, who is the stupid guy? I don't want to be him at all. But that's all we got for the book of Proverbs. It's like a training manual for parents. You should read it often with your kids. Hey, and there's this, uh, if you're in, I know we all have cell phones and all this, but uh, there is a little, a little tiny like Bible-looking book that is the Proverbs cut up by section in, for a daily reading, so 365 readings. And there's no commentary. It's not like a proverb and then a little thing. It's just a daily reading for a proverb. And I found that to be really helpful, just like to have next to my shower, that I can just read a proverb before getting in the shower every single day. And it just is there, can kick it around, mull around in my brain. Because every time I go through it, it's like I've never read it before. I have to highlight it just to prove to myself, no, you have opened this page before. Because you're reading it, I've never even heard that. Because I'm not doing that. But that's obviously wise, that's obviously true. That's why doing the thing that Turner mentioned, reading one chapter a day every month, it's not gonna take you very much time. I mean, you can listen to it in the car on the way to work. Uh, but it'll pay dividends in just shaping your thinking on how I should be approaching these situations and these other situations. Man, we're 50 minutes, 50 seconds early. Brett Paul could be so proud, but he's in Colorado and he can't celebrate with us.